epidural anesthesia involves the insertion of a hollow needle and subsequently a flexible catheter via the patient's back and into the epidural anatomical space that surrounds the spinal meninges and the spinal cord. The technique that was first demonstrated in 1947 by Dr. Manuel Martinez Cuabello allows the delivery of anaesthetic agents directly into the epidural space and thus has become an important means of anaesthetizing or numbing the lower body in patients undergoing surgical procedures, as well as also helping in the management of post-operative pain. Whilst epidural injections of local anaesthetic agents can be performed, typically under fluoroscopic guidance, for the treatment of radicular pain symptoms related to vertebral disc herniations, it's the technique of inserting an epidural catheter in patients undergoing surgical procedures that we're going to focus on in this tutorial. But before we carry on, don't forget to like, subscribe, and turn on those notifications so you don't miss out on any of our new content releases. Okay, let's make a start. So let's remind ourselves of some key anatomy. The spinal cord is located within the spinal canal, or the vertebral foramen, which is created by the vertebral body anteriorly, the pedicles laterally, and then posteriorly, we have the lamina of the vertebrae. Within the spinal canal, the spinal cord is further protected by its meningeal layers. The pia, the arachnoid, and the outermost layer, the dura. The space outside of, or superficial to the dural layer, is known as the epidural space. And it's this area that is targeted for catheter insertion and anesthesia administration when undertaking epidural anesthesia to help inhibit sensory nerve signals arriving to the spinal cord. The other key parts of the vertebra that we need to be aware of are the paired transverse processes which project laterally either side of the bony arch that forms the spinal canal and the spinous process which is the posterior projecting component of the vertebral column which can be palpated when feeling along the midline of the patient's back and neck. As well as bones, ligaments play an important role in both the stabilization of the spinal column and protecting the spinal cord. Three of the structures that are important to be aware of in relation to undertaking epidural anesthesia are the supraspinous and interspinous ligaments, which connect adjacent spinous processes, and also the ligamentum flavum, which is a series of ligaments that connect the ventral parts of the lamini of adjacent vertebrae and help form the wall of the spinal canal, and thus are an important structure to pass via when inserting our epidural needle. Epidural anesthesia may be used alone, providing regional anesthesia, or it may be used in combination with general anesthetic, or GA, where it may provide excellent control of post-operative discomfort and help to reduce the incidence of post-operative atelectasis and chest infections in patients undergoing major abdominal surgery. Epidurals, either alone or in combination with general anesthesia, can be used in patients undergoing thoracic surgery, abdominal surgery, orthopaedic surgeries of the hips and lower limbs, urological procedures, lower limb vascular surgeries, and gynecological or obstetric surgeries, such as a caesarean section. Epidural catheters can be inserted at different points along the vertebral column to achieve different levels of anesthesia and pain control, depending on the indication and the type of surgery the patient's undergoing. The most common sites for insertion are the lumbar spine and the thoracic spine. Lumbar epidural catheters can be used to provide regional anesthesia for lower limb vascular and orthopedic surgeries, lower genitourinary surgeries, and gynecological or obstetric surgeries. Thoracic epidurals can be used to provide post-operative analgesia for thoracic surgery, upper and lower abdominal surgeries, urogenital surgery, and gynecological surgeries. However, the type and nature of the surgery will dictate what level of the vertebral column the catheter is inserted. 
Regarding the contraindications for carrying out epidural anesthesia, these can be divided into absolute contraindications and relative contraindications. Absolute contraindications include the patient refusing the procedure, the patient having an infection at the site of the catheter insertion, raised intracranial pressure, an allergy to local anaesthetic agents, and also uncorrected hypervolemia. Given the potential for epidural anaesthesia to inhibit the sympathetic nerve impulses to arteries and thus cause relaxation of their tone and vasodilatation, leading to worsening of the hypertension and relative hypovolemia. Relative contraindications for epidural anaesthesia include coagulopathy and thrombocytopenia, sepsis, spinal deformities or prior surgeries, an aggressive or uncooperative patient, and trauma patients who may have spinal instability. In patients having epidural catheter insertion for regional anaesthesia, and who will be awake during the insertion, the procedure is typically tolerated well, with only the need for local anaesthetic. However, in more anxious patients, we may also want to use some mild sedation prior to the epidural insertion to help the patient feel more comfortable and more relaxed. In patients undergoing general anaesthesia, as well as receiving epidural anaesthetic, typically to help post-operative discomfort, the procedure can be performed whilst the patient is under general anaesthesia. And it's this technique that we'll be demonstrating in this video. The majority of the equipment needed to perform epidural catheter insertion is available in pre-prepared kits. These include an epidural needle, typically 17 gauge, and approximately three and a half inches in length, a 10 ml syringe, which during the procedure will be filled with air and attached to the needle and used to check for loss of resistance to expelling the air, which will indicate that the needle tip has penetrated the ligamentum flavum and is correctly sitting within the epidural space. We also need an epidural catheter, usually a 19 or 20 gauge, some local anaesthetic solution for administering via the epidural catheter, antimicrobial solution for cleaning the area, a drape to place over the entry site, a sterile adhesive dressing, and also sterile gloves, a gown, a mask, and a cap. In patients who will be awake during the procedure, we'll also need a syringe, a needle, and 1% lidocaine for performing a local infiltration prior to inserting the catheter. In the awake patient, epidural catheterization is commonly performed with the patient in a sitting position. However, in the patient under general anaesthetic, as is in this case, the lateral decubitus position is typically adopted. The patient in this case was undergoing liver surgery and thus was having a thoracic epidural catheter inserted for post-operative pain control. Having put on our surgical mask and cap, washed our hands, and then put on our sterile gown and gloves, we clean the insertion site with antiseptic solution. We then place a sterile drape with a hole in the middle over the catheter insertion site located at the lower thoracic vertebral column. We palpate to feel the spinous process of the vertebra. In the thoracic region, the spinous processes are more angulated than those within the lumbar region. And therefore, there's less space to insert the needle and catheter along the midline. As a result, we need to introduce the epidural needle just lateral to the midline, using what we refer to as a paramedian approach. The needle is inserted in a cranial direction with the aim of passing over the superior aspect of the vertebral laminae and then via the ligamentum flavum into the epidural space. Having introduced the needle a few centimetres, we attach the syringe filled with air and continue inserting the needle along the same trajectory. As the needle hits the tough ligamentum flavum, it will experience more resistance. However, as the needle reaches the epidural space, this resistance is lost. 
we then press the plunger of the air-filled syringe to test for the loss of resistance that will indicate that we've successfully reached the epidural space and thus can start inserting the catheter. Having detached the syringe, we can then introduce the epidural catheter via the needle. And for an additional 4 to 5 centimeters beyond the tip of the needle, so that it lies safely within the epidural space. A nice technique for securing the catheter and preventing its accidental dislodgement or removal is to pass a large bore venous cannula through the skin. And then using a scalpel blade, we detach the cannula hub, leaving the catheter component of the venous cannula as a tunnel within the skin. While securely maintaining the position of the epidural catheter, we carefully remove the introducer needle. Before feeding the epidural catheter via the tunnel in the skin formed by the catheter of the venous cannula. Having then pulled the majority of the epidural catheter through this tunnel, we can then remove the venous cannula catheter and securely snug down the secured epidural catheter. We then attach a connector to the end of the epidural catheter and flush with the local anaesthetic to ensure the catheter is correctly secured and located within the epidural space. After removing the sterile drape, we then create two loops of the catheter around the entry site before then securing the epidural catheter to the patient's back with a transparent adhesive dressing. The connector can then be attached to a device which enables the patient to control their post-operative pain with patient-controlled epidural analgesia, or PCEA, during their immediate post-op recovery period. Whilst epidural anesthesia is used extensively and in the vast majority of cases safely, there are potential complications, mild and severe, that we need to be aware of. These range from relatively common side effects such as pruritus, headaches, nausea and vomiting, and temporal loss of bladder control, to more alarming and thankfully more rare complications such as bacterial meningitis, spinal cord and nerve root injuries, epidural hematomas, and significant epidural anesthesia related hypotension, resulting in cardiovascular collapse arrhythmias, and even death. So thankfully, whilst these severe complications are very rare, it's important that practitioners are aware of their potential occurrence. And as a result, monitor the patient closely following the procedure and act quickly and efficiently to remedy them, stabilise the patient, and prevent any further deterioration. If you found this video helpful, then make sure you subscribe to our channel for more great free content. Or, if you want to make learning for med school and board exams easier, then subscribe to surgicalteaching.com and check out our expert endorsed videos, high yield revision questions, and our supportive online community. Surgical Teaching was designed by doctors to help students learn smarter. And right now, you can enjoy all of our great content for less, with 20% off our annual premium subscriptions when using the code STYouTube20. Thanks for watching guys and I'll see you soon.